So I had to revisit some of the uh, pieces that I made some years ago. I forgot what year actually. And I borrowed this from um, a real close friend of the family. And I've discovered that I made it in 2020. It's considered a demi lune or occasional table, or in this case, it would be also a game table. So you have a top that flips open and you have a gaming surface here. And then you have these back legs that pivot out. I'll swing that around in a second to show you, but so it is supported like this. And you can see these strong curves on the front. And then you have this center section, which in, on this table doubles as a drawer. Pretty sweet. Anyway, it's made to be concealed here. You've got all Cuban mahogany on here, ribbon cut, which is actually the quarter sawn section of mahogany creates this ribbon figure. And so across the top, you can see this is one wide cut right here. So here's plain sawn figure. You have those wider bands and then the stripy quarter sawn figure over here. So this is the quarter sawn grain and I use this material actually to create some of that vertical figure. But I want to talk more about creating these curves over here. This is a pretty tight bend and we want to make something that's not only strong, but it's stable and it's going to stay in shape. So that's what I want to share with you tonight. Now I'm going to move this table. Let's show you the back. Actually, I did say I would. Um, so here you have these legs that swing out on good old fashioned wooden knuckle joints. There's a nice little hand catch underneath and this leg will swing out and stop. And the other one will come out and stop this way. And I have this little pieces of felt embedded in there so that it supports the top like that from the back. So that's the classic game table. You and said you made it in 2020, but I think it was 2002. Was it? I can verify right now. It was a ways back. Uh, it's 2001. Wow. Summer of 2001. So yeah, you had that right. This one was 2002, but I wanted you to see the interior here, this is a simpler version. We don't have the gate or hinged legs in the back. This is a fixed top. It's just that shape and it goes, uh, it's very similar to the other one, but no game table or anything like that. So I want you to see though, you can see how tight that curvature is. And then the way these legs are let into the curve, housed, you might say, <laughs> the back leg is also housed. Housed just means it's recessed and, and embedded in. So it's housed, it's fixed in there all around. Uh, here we've got it housed in the front little corner about a quarter inch deep there. And then these glue blocks are applied on the side for a really nice rigidizing strengthening to it. Um, it's cut offset so that the curvature of this turning element here is flush with that base. And you can see that that is a solid Gaboon ebony line about 3 16 wide at the bottom of this curved apron. And then the feet also are solid ebony. But we don't want to get into that tonight. We'll just talk about this curvature. So let's get into how we originally come up with the shape, and then the process to go through of creating that type of shape. One way I usually do it is just start sketching. Uh, quite often I'll find inspiration from history, uh, meaning steal ideas. <laughs> no, but I do actually take a lot of inspiration from period furniture. I'm always looking at what other people are doing. Um, you might capture some new ideas on Instagram or whatever. I haven't stolen any ideas, don't worry. <laughs> I'm sure people, I love being an open book, as you know. So I'm happy for you <laughs> to have inspiration from me. Uh, but anyway, I'm always getting it 
everywhere else. And as a lot of you know, the New Hampshire Furniture Masters has been instrumental. And that's where I came up with this kind of inspiration to make this strong curved apron. So when I was designing it, I did come across a table, a period table, which uh, was a, a Duncan Fife pedestal table, and it had that very similar curvature. So once I had the, the idea in mind, I sketched it to scale. So I knew I wanted it about 18 inches deep and about 38 inches long. And then I was able to, with my sketch, I could see about how far in I wanted the lobe and I did everything to scale. And then I was able to expand that scale drawing up to an actual size drawing. And I began with the top because everything works from the top profile inward. Okay, so we know once we have that curve of the top established, we're going to step in for the front of our apron curves. And then we'll step in the thickness of those aprons for the forms that we're going to shape those curves around. So here's actually the initial shape that I made for that game table. You can see the game table board here. Here's the overall size of it. Yes, 38. Oh, this one, 17 and a quarter. I think I made this one deeper. 17 and a half. Okay, so when this was opened up, it would have been 34 and a half. So by 38. All right, so um, what I did here was drew the curve to the size I had on my scale drawing. So I measured it over and I could see I was about nine and three quarters to the center line. That's the center line of that seam right there. And then I could see that I didn't come all the way to the front here. I'm only 15 and five eighths to the front of that curve. Where here it's 17 and a quarter. So once you have that laid out, I sawed the curve into one half, almost like building a bed. You just have to do half of the shape, okay? Anything that's symmetrical, chair backs, headboards of beds, uh, what else can you think of? Well, tables like this. You only need to draw half of the piece. So I've got a center line here, and then once I have this half established, I've got it nice and smooth. I was then able to make a master template here, where I use this as the pattern to route, to flush route on, by flipping it around. And I flush routed to that piece, which gave me a quarter inch thick master template. Okay, so this, this became the pattern for where we were going here and how we were gonna make this table. Let me turn it this way. All right, so we've got our strong lobes and we've got our dimensions are all set up. What's really nice about this type of panel, which once you have that set up, it's symmetrical, it's the shape. Now I can put all my, I can draw all my elements stepping in the appropriate offsets that I want from the edge. So let's just do that just by measuring over here. Let's see what we have. So I'm um, three eighths of an inch here and looks like a little more seven sixteenths. Maybe I meant it to be seven sixteenths, but it doesn't really matter. When you're dealing with an overhang like that, you're probably gonna have a little bit of fluctuation, not more than a sixteenth of an inch. You'll never see it. It's just nice to have the line established there. So that line represents the outside surface of my apron. That's how much I'm gonna step in. The second line, I got two lines there actually, but let me just use my tape here. All right, so it's, more, it's the inner line is showing seven eighths of an inch from that surface in. And that is the inside surface, that inner line there, of my apron because my apron material is going to be seven eighths of an inch thick right about there all right so this inner shape then 
is the shape that I need to make my form around which I'm going to bend the layers of my material to make that strong bend. Now, yes, there are traditional ways of doing this. If you like the traditional way, I applaud you. I love that myself. I would, it's fun to try it. Uh, by that, I mean using white pine in a brick laid manner. It's kind of fun. You can build it up, stack it up like bricks and cut the saw the curve, the whole height, and then fair and clean it up and then veneer over and you'll have it in no time at all. <laughs> <laughs> this is another way. Uh, this, this way you really get the satisfaction of a curve that is super strong and holds its own. So you can use this in a lot of uh, situations where you maybe you don't want to bricklay. So up to you. Once you have your uh, overall shape inside that dimensional parameter that you're working with, you're then going to land, as I just mentioned, with this inner curve that's the form curve. Then you're going to, uh, we're going to laminate the thickness of our side and then have our overhang there. So we want that kind of curve. So what I did was I attached a piece of paper to this and then I could just take a small square. I'm not going to, have to go through all the steps. I just want you to see that if we had, say, a 3 8 overhang here, and then we were coming in to our 7 8 we could just set this to an inch and a quarter to that. And you don't have to be so fussy here because you're kind of creating your own little world, you know? You're going to put a little birdie right here. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. You can't really make a mistake here, but, um, a happy cloud. Yeah. So then I would use that as my reference and on that paper or cardboard, like thin, um, cardboard, I would draw out and then mark the key line, like in the back here, where this actually is going to go almost all the way to the back. Okay. So this is the back rail here and this is going to be attached in here and then up in the front the key line is I need it to at least come to here so I'm going to make my form over long in both directions and then when I laminate I'll make my laminations a little over long and they'll be trimmed right to this line after the fact all right so after doing that I took the cardboard or paper and transferred it to a solid piece and you end up with something weird like this. <laughs> this is actually the side form. So we can see that if I match up these lines, I come pretty darn close to hitting right on that. See that that's our inner shape for our form. So this would be the inner form shape for your master form. Now this was where my first table stopped, but I made this one a little deeper. Um, this was a second one, so it's a half inch deeper than the first table. All right, so there you have it. Once we have our side or apron form pattern, this is the pattern, we're ready to build the form. I built this form right here. Check it out. All right, that is this shape, exactly six inches high, all right? Now I started out, it wasn't so high. Um, I've made variations, obviously, of this table. Some had deeper aprons, and that initial one that I showed you, the game table, had a deeper apron like that. So I ended up with six stacked high to give me four and a half. Should be four and a half, yeah. And then later on, I made a thinner apron and I realized, hey, if I just put two more layers, I'll have six inches high and then I can make the bend and I'll cut it down the middle and I'll end up with both sides in one glue up. So, cause those sides ended up only being about two and five eighths or three quarters at the most. So I had plenty to spare by just doing it in one glue up. So 
make your pattern, your form appropriate to whatever you're doing. Like you can get both halves out at once if you stack up and build a higher form. So this form is made this funky shape initially because we're going to use strap clamps to clamp, clamp this to the form. A lot of times you can use uh, regular clamps. Um, you could use, uh, gosh, there's so many ways of doing it. You can use an outer form clamp, but here I'm going to use a strap. This is a nice method. It's a nice opportunity to show you the method too. So we'll use these heavy straps to come around. So in order to do that, you need some space for the ratcheting clamps over here. I actually could have made this larger. You know, I could have made it out and a little more rounded so that when I pull the straps, they would pull a little easier around this corner. Because you see, we, we're going to pull the straps right around this corner. It was my first go at this shape and it works. It's not optimal though. You can be thinking of that. If you're making a larger form, have it so that your, your strap is out there and it's not pulling around any hard corner edges. Makes it just a little easier. All right, so once I have that, I just take my first piece of the form material, which in this case is three quarter inch MDF. I'd get the lightweight if you can, because sometimes these forms can get really chunky. And this is gonna be a solid form. So um, I take that first piece, just draw this out, bandsaw heavy to the line, and then I tack this to that piece and flush route around it. Now I have a three quarter inch center core of my form, exactly like my form. Then I'll go ahead and draw out two more, two more, <laughs> okay, and bandsaw heavy to the line again, and then those, each one gets glued and just tacked quickly to that first panel we made. So the first panel was already precisely this shape because we flush routed to it. Now we take those next two and make a sandwich and they're overlapping a little and then you just go to your router table with your flush bearing bit and you flush route bearing against that center layer and flip it over and do the same from the other side and just keep stacking on both sides however many you want or just go one side whatever you're going to be shocked how nice and true it is i mean this is all the method i use to make this form and you end up with a really nice square and perpendicular uh, form so there you are once i've got this uh, my form then takes on some key marks that came off of my initial pattern and here's that key mark this is the point that i need this is where the joint happens so you have the center of your table and then the outside and then this is where the back happens so i'm going to be going further i'll be making sure i get more but i have to get full layering out to this point here and so those lines were transferred onto my form here and you can see i've got a line going right down the front here that's that key marker so i'm going to have my layers go beyond that so i can trim it later and then on the side i've got the same thing happening actually right here and there's a line going right down the side so i've got to get to this point all right all right so let's do some laminating we're just going to blast through one of these and I want you to see the process. We won't get too fancy here, but what we're gonna do is take some lamination material. Now, what's that gonna be? Well, you could use actual solid wood laminations, uh, actually pieces of veneer, like thick enough veneer. You can make your own, you can resaw it, run it through a thickness sander. That's a little time consuming. But if you want to have the appearance and that strength of a natural wood curved bend, if you keep those pieces in sequence when you resaw them, after you glue them all together around the curve, it's going to look like a solid rail. 
if you know so it's it's a cool technique usually you're using that method when you're exposing the curve you might do a laminated curve like this using a strap or whatever around a large arc of some sort that will be seen no uh no no big deal but i mean you don't always have to use that solid method though underneath so here are some layers of solid wood material this is this is all poplar and this was not resawn and sanded but purchased this way it's 1 16th of an inch thick and from different veneer companies the one in particular that i think of is certainly wood out in new york you can go on their website and look at their materials right there and they have a section called special thickness veneers and check it out see what they have i mean a lot of times they'll have um even up to 1 20th of an inch but usually they'll have variations of thicknesses so you have to decide can i get by with that thick of a bed this is really as thick as i want to go for this bend 1 16th of an inch when you stack these up into 14 layers and you're going to pull that bend i mean look at that that's taking some force but that's where the straps come in and when you get the glue on there it, it relaxes the veneer a little bit to make that bend what we're going to do is instead of using solid wood layers we're going to use a man-made species uh just a a type of plywood there's let's see oh let me just show you this is how that certainly would came those pieces i cut them down from a massive sheet of like this that's a 16th of an inch thick so you can get this stuff in extraordinary dimensions it's not expensive either because it's not it's not primary veneer it's they know it's secondary they know it's not likely going to be seen so you don't pay a premium for it and it a lot of times the savings you get by buying it not doing the labor you'll be glad you bought it already but check this out this is some funky plywood you might say wacky because <laughs> that's what it's often termed wacky wood and it's it's really wild it's it's very floppy and all of the grain is running this way that's why it bends so easily you can see all the stringiness of the grain running this way it's running that way on both sides but you can see that one little layer in the middle there see that dark line that's where you have some veneer uh running perpendicular so that is a rigidizing stabilizing force but it's very thin so it's still it bends very easily in that direction okay but not so much in the other direction it's pretty stiff the other way because most of your grain is running vertically along this end so this is a piece of bending plywood or wacky wood if you call to buy it uh, a lot of plywood dealers will have it and when you purchase it this is this is about a strong 5 16 so when you buy it I think they consider it 3 8 or maybe it's in millimeters I forget sorry uh, but this they'll ask you do you want a an 8 foot cylinder or a 4 foot cylinder this is a 8 foot cylinder because you can get it going the other way you know so the grain's running this way and it would bend really easily to make a circle or a 4 foot high cylinder or they might say do you want a column or a barrel same thing eight or four foot all right so this is what we're going to use it's a lot cheaper really and it's super easy to use tom can you talk about what you have around the form there's some questions about the uh tape yeah this is just packing tape that i applied to the form after so that when we get to the gluing stage we don't actually glue our layers right to the form the packing tape will break free of the glue it won't stick to the glue um i before using packing tape i used to just wax it heavily that'll work too and you can just get wax all over so the whole this thing. process doesn't need any steam right no this is not steam bending solid we are laminating which just means taking multiple thinner layers and gluing them 
around a surface. All right, so we're gonna use the wacky wood method. There's also eighth inch bending ply. This is a little finer version of bending ply and it comes very thin. It's actually a little under an eighth. So I think you'd call it three millimeter. Um, but see how nicely that bends? But not so much this way, it's a little more rigid. <laughs> but it's a nicer texture, it's beautifully smooth, and it's usually referred to as Italian bending ply. We're gonna go with the, uh, a combination actually. So here's our sandwich. We've got, I've already cut the pieces, six inch by 22, and here's that wacky wood. Look at that. It bends so easily, so we know we're gonna make it around that curve easily, right? No problem. But once we glue up the layers, I'm gonna throw in some 16th inch uh, regular poplar, and that being every other layer, so I have one down the middle and one outside, I'm basically making my own plywood. So once that goes around, now this has been much easier, and when that glue sets, those variant layers are going to stabilize that sandwich really well, because now I'm going to have three 16th inch layers going across that grain. It, it still can work without these, but I like how it gives you a nice stable surface, and it also gives you a much smoother interior exterior so that if you're going to veneer over the top of that in my case i use that that linear mahogany that has a nice surface to go on to all right so let's go ahead and glue one up i need some paper and here's our layers now before we get too far we want to make sure that we've got the marks so that we're going to get around our frame okay. That looks pretty good. Okay, so right on my finger there. I'm just gonna make, I'll just use a marker here. Okay, we'll get them all stacked up here. So that's my reference line. I have to be on my form there to come around and make it far enough over there, okay? So if these were stacked solid, I would have that mark and I would make a V mark as well, keep being organized. And that's also, in this case, is gonna keep me organized to stack these up properly. The arrow's going toward the form and that's how we're gonna put it together. All right, so I'm gonna open it up and now I've gotta mix up some glue. Here's a little demo that I used during the Epic Weekend, kind of fun. I showed some different glues and how they cure. So we have Elmer's white glue, which is breaks, but it, there's a lot of flexibility to it. So if this was even thinner, I can feel, you know how when the glue dries on the bottle or on a surface, and you notice it's kind of rubbery. That's what you get with white. With the tight bond too, um, with Extend, this is basically Type Bond Original. This is a little more rigid and you can hear it. It cracks quite easily. Uh, so the glue is considered harder and more stable bond than the flexibility of the other. Type Bond 3 is made to be waterproof and used outside. So what would you guess this glue might be? Is it going to be really hard and rigid or more flexible. You guessed it. There's a lot of elasticity to this one. So this is really awesome for exterior applications, but it's not as great for veneering uh, or doing laminations. It's not like it's going to, you're threatened to have it slip a lot, but if you want to make sure that you're going to hold you wanna use a harder, more brittle glue when doing laminating. High glue here, this is the 192 gram strength. This has some flexibility to it too, but let's see. But look at that, it does fracture when you bend it hard enough. It's amazing how 
this is a natural glue. Such a cool material. Now we're getting into the harder glues. This is a combination of a PVA glue, polyvinyl acetate, and urea formaldehyde. So this has a kind of hard, harder working action, but you use it very much like a PVA glue. It, it does dry hard though. And so it's, it's a pretty cool, good glue for veneering. Um, and you can laminate with it as well. But when I'm really looking for the ultimate laminating glue, I want to use a true urea formaldehyde glue. Uh, these two, by the way, are available for, um, I mean, this Unibond one is available from veneer pressing systems. And then you have, you can buy it from them, what's called Unibond 800. I think it's vacuum pressing systems. Yeah, vacuum pressing systems. That's what I meant to we say. We put the links in the description below. Yeah, that's where you get this Unibond 800. This is a true urea formaldehyde glue. The last one I want to show you that's the hardest, best for, for laminating. Uh, Unibond 1 is a combination, so you don't have to mix it. Works a lot more like your typical PVA glues, but it does, as you can see, it dries. It's more brittle. It does, it's not as flexible as any of those others. Um, but when you really want to get to the hard stuff, this is basically like peanut brittle, if you remember that. <laughs> I mean, this stuff is really hard. There's really very, almost no flex to it at all. It dries almost like glass. In fact, when it's cured on the form, you got to watch out. You don't cut yourself on it. It's that sharp. So this is great for laminating where you know you want it to stay dead on. You just got to let it have time to cure around the form. Nice thing about it, it gives you a lot of open time, but usually it's a two-part system like the Unibond 800. This example here is from a powder. You just add water. It's called VacBond 2000. You can get that from quality vacuum products and that also is in the description. So, and then veneer supplies is another place. And uh, certainly wood is there too. Yeah, certainly wood. Okay, so now that we have that, I'm going to mix up the powder because that has a longer uh, shelf life. The thing about the, the Unibond 800 where you have the liquid in the powder, it only lasts a year at stored at under 60 degrees. If you're storing it higher, your time starts to dramatically reduce how long it lasts on the shelf. So you got to keep it cool to get it to last the longest. The powder on the other hand lasts a lot longer. Be, you just got to keep it cool and dry as well. So that's what I have over here. This is a old five, uh, 25 pound bucket that I had of Vacbon 2000 almost gone, but I've had it for a little while. So I'm going to mix up some of that. I'm going to do it down here on the floor so I don't kick up any dust. You really shouldn't be breathing this stuff. So I'll put on my mask and I'm going to use the pad, a paddle in my drill like this. Cause you really got to make sure this stuff stirs up. So I've got the appropriate measurement for a small mix. I've got the water in this one and I'm going to pour the Vacbon 2000 in here very gently. Okay, now I'm just going to go. All right, so we can see, see when it spans between the paddle, let's see, almost like doing bubbles. That's about the right mixture. If it's not, it's a little thin. If it feels too thick, you can just add a little water. Too thin, add a little powder. 
All right, so I'm, I'm about just right. I'm, I'm not too thin, but I'm a little, I would say I'm a little on the thinner side than the thicker, just so you know what you're seeing here. I'm going to pour my mixture into my little glue roller. There you go. All right, so you can see what I'm doing. I'm just rolling it like paint, but we'll get a nice layer on the wacky wood here. And then we're going to put another layer on the opposite. So the nice thing, like I said, about this glue is it gives you a lot of working time. Um, I'm talking like 45 minutes, you know, or if it's really cool in the shop up to an hour because this stuff cures with heat. Um, so it's kind of, kind of tricky sometimes because if your shop is too cold, you have to actually heat the form. And I use electric blankets for that. Um, pretty common among people doing this kind of thing. Okay, go ahead. Peter's curious, so you're alternating the grain direction of the layers. Yes, Peter, that's how I have it set up. I got the two, uh, the two wacky wood layers are running this way, so they bend easily. And then you can see the three 16th inch thick veneer. I decided to make that kind of sandwich. I mean, you could combine eighth inch bending ply solid or just stick with uh, just bending wacky wood and it would work. But I like to just alternate here and it creates a, a more rigid, better grade kind of laminated curve at the end and gives you that nice smooth surface on the outside for veneering your tops material. You notice I'm doing this in two stages. If you're, you're going to put a decorative veneer on the outside, it's a little too much in a lot of times to try to do it at the same time as you're doing the bending stage. So I usually do it in two stages just so I can focus on making sure the curve gets right. And then you can put your finished veneer on without sweating it as much. Okay. Um, wood movement. What about wood movement for these curved woods in relation to glue? This is going to dry really hard. You're, what you're doing is you're creating a kind of plywood of your own. So um, I'm stabilizing this wood and the, because you're, you're gluing up thinner layers and you've got that hard glue line between, you're, you're restricting the movement with the glue itself. Plus I'm alternating directional and I'm creating a stable plywood, just like regular plywood being very stable because it alternates every sheet. So uh, that's what we're doing. We're, it's working out well. You don't have to worry about the movement in that case. Good. That's, that's one of the advantages to making your own laminate bends because you're controlling the shape and the stability of the material more so than sometimes solid wood. You know, obviously if you steam bend something, it's going to go around the curve and you get a lot of flex back and you still, it still acts like wood where laminating your own like this you're creating a beautiful kind of uh, solid laminated piece. All right, that's it. I've got all my layers. I also put it up on these riser blocks, just gets it off the table so that the glue's not all smearing around. It ends up getting on here some, but it'll drop, drip down onto your main table. Now I'm gonna use my reference line right here, that arrow to pin it to the form, initially here. This is gonna hold me to get me started. And I'm gonna use two, whoops, I forgot one thing. See, as I was going to pressure this on here, imagine if I press this on or put my straps directly on the wood. Sometimes it's soft enough so when the strap goes on there, 
it'll actually squish the strap into the piece and you'll have a waviness to it. So you always want to use a transitionary call of some thickness. So we're going to use four pieces of eighth inch masonite. Uh, I use four because, you know, you, you need it to bend around the curve. And I found that four also uh, creates a thick enough surface that the straps do not telegraph through onto the material. So here we've got to get our call on and this is going to get stacked and in position. And I you got to clamp it there. I knew something was missing. I went to clamp it. I'm like, this feels thin, but here we go. Now I'm going to pin the call in the right spot and just get this clamp to hold it while we get our clamp, our strap clamps in place. All right, so this is the bottom strap. I'm gonna go around, I've, I've marked it. These are two inch wide straps and I got these from like a trucking company, you know? And this is gonna come around. Let's see, I'm gonna bring it up to about here. And I've gotta bring this hook around and hopefully I can bring these together. Let me pull it a little further around. Okay. So I pre-set these so that they were close. And I'm gonna just set that right at the appropriate height there. There it is. Come on around. There, now this is holding it in place. I'm gonna get the pressure going with this lower part. So look, we're ratcheting. You can see it pulling it around there. Plus I'm staying over here. I don't wanna lose it over here. I wanna make sure I, that piece stays beyond that line, which it is, that's far enough. And now I'm gonna really snap this in a little. That's why I have it clamped to the bench. All right, that looks nice. Now with that in, snugged up, I can take this out. Want to make sure everything's sitting down on my forms. So creates better alignment if I can move it at this point. So now I know everything's in plane. Uh, now I'm going to get the second clamp on. So here we go. Now we're going to, let me just get this out of the way a little bit. Now we're just going to watch. We want to pull this in. I think we're about there, maybe one more. Yeah, I got one more there. Okay, that's nice and tight. We're really tight on our form all the way around. Every now and then you have a spot where if you're slightly asymmetrical, like here, I think I've got one little spot right here where it, it bows out slightly the way it's pulling around this corner. This probably would have been eliminated if I made the form a little longer, but see, I've got a little spring right there. So for that, I just used a supplemental block, which I'm going to put on the outside here. And I dug out that hole so I can come down in here. Let me get the pad off. We'll get that down as far as we can. Pretty close to center. Let me tap it a little more. Okay. And we'll get it right over that little bumpy spot and snug her right up. There it is. All right. This baby is in the form and everything is in good position. Now it's just a matter of time. So here, <laughs> You want to be over 70 degrees for these things to cure. So you've got to have that. Uh, remember, you may have to put some paper over the gluey area. And then I wrap an electric blanket, you know, over the top. And you can put a moving blanket over the top of that and get it really warm. So you put it to bed and then you come out the next day and you feel under there. It's nice and toasty. And that, that thing is solid. I try to leave it on there as long as I possibly can, like several days if possible, 
because there may still be some moisture in there. And it's funny, if these do change form a little bit, usually they spring a little tighter after, as time goes on. You know, usually when you think of steam bent material, it always will loosen and, and go larger than the curve. Here, if you take them out too soon, they may actually tighten up as, they, as the glue cures and dries out. So if you can keep it on there a couple days, you'll be amazed how it'll fit dead on there. Do you leave the electric blanket on for just that first night? Or do you do it only subsequent days? I leave it on as long as the temperature is, you want to keep that temperature above 70 degrees. So leave it on there if you have to. If your shop is really cool, like mine has been in winter, I learned that the hard way. I came out the next day, I had it in the press and took the pressure off the press and, every, and everything relaxed and everything sprung right up. Like it, not much had happened. It was just too cold. So there you have it. That's all glued up. Let me show you an example. After this pops out, you're going to have a little toboggan just like this. <laughs> all right. So this is the actual same process. So I have the two layers of the 5 sixteenths uh, bending ply, and then there's alternating layers of 16th inch. I wish I could show you how this fits dead on there, but it does. And um, this is an example of all poplar. So there's 14 layers there of 16th inch thick poplar. So there you have that material. Now it's a little uneven. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to go through the whole process right now, but we did, we did do this at the Epic Weekend. After this stage, then you can veneer it with the vertical, which I did in that case. You can go whatever direction you want. And my pieces did get veneered and it just goes right back in the press with the same calls. It's so much easier to execute that bend because you're only gluing on the veneer. You can leave the inside usually without. You can always apply a piece if you want it at that point. But I would, uh, usually I don't on the inside like that because it's the secondary wood and it matches typically the back board. So this would get veneered and then I have to saw it in half. So I actually take this piece when it's got the new fresh veneer on there and run it over the joiner. So you can just joint an edge and you can do this with a narrower joiner. I used to do this with a six inch joiner. Eight works better, obviously. Um, but you'll joint one edge and then I will make a, I'll cut this down the middle on the bandsaw. So uh, if I'm, in that case, the bandsaw blade is tra traveling down like this and exiting on the front. So I'll run a piece of tape down there to restrict tear out right there. And then it gets, it's kind of fun because you get to bandsaw following this curve right on around and you'll end up with a couple pieces like this. So here's a couple that were together. I think these were two were, yeah, see these were together like that and they were bandsawn apart and there you have it. You got two nice halves. And now, now you can see this is taking shape to the front. And then I would go ahead and joint that edge again and get that nice and clean and then bandsaw to the final width and you would end up with some pieces. Do I have any more? I think I do. By the way, here's the center drawer section. So that's over just a little different form or not necessarily the drawer. Oh, here they are. So here's another set of them. Let me move this out of the way. I just want to come on into the front. This template is helpful. This is your friend now because once you get to this point, you can use it for assembly. So these pieces are actually laid on top here and marked. So 
once I have these cut, let's say I had this cut to width, I would set it on my pattern and swing it over until you see it fit nicely inside the margin. So there we are, right, right about there. And then I would make a mark right here on the inside and the outside of that line, square those lines up and then across and bandsaw across there. Now you could also take the time to set up a jig and where you clamp this to the jig and you made a cross cut. That's a lot more time. If you're going to make a lot of them, it might be worth it, but it's actually goes pretty fast to bandsaw and then clean that up by hand, which is what I did on this one. So this has been bandsawed using this layout template as you're working in the curved space. So this, this gives you a lot of guidance as you go along and then your centerpiece will come in and you'll do the same thing. You'll joint bandsaw and then joint that edge. And you're looking to when you have it pressed together, how does the joint look? It looks pretty sweet, right? And then you're gonna see the alignment be good across the front. Now, usually I'll clamp one there. But anyway, that's generally the, the way you piece this together. And then you'll cut the back corner and fit in your back piece. These I pre-drill and I actually run three plug screws in there. Um, and with that glue joint, remember this is bending ply mostly. So all the grain, the side grain is running this way. So it's pretty strong glue joint because you're gluing side grain to side grain. Plus I'm going to embed and run some screws in there. Uh, this is not as structural. This is more um, of a valence because this has a center pedestal, this one. All right, everybody. Wow. Well, that was a crash course, <laughs> admittedly. Remember, if you are interested in this content, head over to epicwoodworking.com and you'll find out all the other courses we offer there. But mostly, move into the neighborhood. That's where you <laughs> want to be. And remember uh, to like, share, and subscribe. But I don't even care about that. I'm just glad you're here. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.